Oh my God, they came over here to talk to them that they violated. This morning, outrage over cops being taunted and doused with water. The video goes viral. The condemnation comes from as high as the White House. We'll hear from the chief of the NYPD. Plus, Por espacio de dos años y medio, trabajé junto a mi familia. the governor of Puerto Rico agrees to resign after days of monumental protests. Where does the impoverished island go from here? We'll get the views from our panel of specialists. Now, from 42nd and 2nd, this is PIX11 News Close-Up with Marvin Scott. Good morning. New York police officers showed remarkable restraint this past week, but people the world over reacted with disgust over uniformed officers being taunted and doused with water. Incidents in Harlem and Brooklyn recorded on video that went viral show punks jeering and laughing as they toss buckets of water at officers. One officer was hit in the head with a bucket while making an arrest. Two female cops were doused while on patrol in Brownsville. The attacks and disrespect of police officers immediately denounced, even prompting a tweet by President Trump. We love our law enforcement officers all around this great country, he writes. What took place in New York City with water being tossed on NYPD officers was a total disgrace. It is time for Mayor de Blasio to stand up for those who protect our lives and serve us all so well. What took place was completely unacceptable and will not be tolerated. Bill de Blasio should act immediately. Now, the mayor did call the acts unacceptable, but police and police unions were much more vocal. Chief of the NYPD, uh, Terry Monahan, was outraged, and he called the incidents reprehensible. It's good to have Chief Monahan in, in with us this morning. Now, I've been covering reporting in New York 50 years. I've never, I've seen police have been taunted, but I've never seen anything quite like this. Oh, this but the idea of the water getting thrown on the officer's head, that, that was really reprehensible. That was horrible. I mean, there's been instances throughout the years of things being thrown at police officers during arrest. There have been times, bottles thrown, I remember greatly, 1992, the Washington Heights riots. But this is something that cannot be stood for. And I'm, I'm very proud to announce that our, we've made arrests. In all three of those incidents that you've seen in, in, uh, in Harlem, we locked up two individuals, one of which was a 28-year-old man who had been arrested and done time for shooting somebody. Uh, in the 7-3 incident, where that horrific dumping of water on a police officer's head, he was arrested. Another 28-year-old man, gang member, uh, who's on probation from a robbery arrest. And just yesterday, we made an arrest in that Bronx incident where the two female police officers were out on the street. Again, a 24-year-old man, gang member, on probation for robbery. These aren't kids that are throwing water at, uh, at our officers. These were adults. These weren't kids playing. These were adults causing mayhem. But it leaves a perception that it's open season on cops. Listen, it's not. This is incidents that have happened. This all happened in one weekend, one very hot weekend where things got out of control. Our cops responded. There were other incidences throughout the city that day where our cops responded and made arrests. This city has never been in better shape right now. Look back where we were in the early 90s and 80s. This isn't even close to where it was. Water was thrown on our officers. We made arrests in each and every one of those incidents. Now, police officers are trained not to overreact. But in this incident, the police officers didn't react at all. Why not? Well, in the 2-8, they did react. That was... That, there were two videos that came out with the 2-8. One that showed a woman getting a bucket of water thrown over our head, and then the incident where the officers were making arrests. That's all one incident. The officers that made that arrest were responding to that original incident of the woman having the water thrown over her head, and that person that they had over the car was the man who dumped a bucket of water over her head. The incident in the 7-3 was a little more troubling. Uh, more could have been done. There were young officers. I'm not going to... Uh, talk specifically about what they did, but more should have been done that day. And we, once we saw that video, we were very quick to react and make sure we made that arrest. As a matter of fact, it was one of our neighborhood coordination officers that as soon as he saw that video pop up on Instagram, thank you for posting that on Instagram because we were able to make that arrest right away. Well, those officers who did not react immediately, will they be disciplined? They're going to be trained. They're going to be spoken to. They made a decision. I'm not going to destroy them on a decision that they made not to confront right then. 
Uh, should we have gotten some other people over there to handle that situation? They were there to respond to a call. People were calling for help because it was getting out of control. They should have done a little bit more, but we, we will talk with them. They were very young officers, and uh, it'll be addressed. Now, are you looking to make more arrests? There's still uh, a couple more individuals in the Harlem incident, the one who threw the bucket at the police officer. We're still looking for him and that sprayed the water. So we have the two that originally bucketed the woman on the street, and now we're looking for a couple more. But we will get them eventually. Now, how do you respond, Chief, to the, those who, who are saying Mayor de Blasio is partially responsible for this, his progressive policies, the, uh, the rhetoric that's been out there for, for so many years? How do you respond to that? I don't want to get into any political discussions, but... Uh, this city is as safe as it's ever been. It's never been safer. Our cops have relationships with the communities that they've never had before. Uh, no one could have imagined that we'd be consistently coming in with under 300 homicides in a city of 8.6 million people, coming in with under 800 shootings a year of a city of 8.6 million. We were doing 5,000 shootings a year, 2,000 homicides a year. Look where we are right now. This city couldn't be in better shape, and that's due to the men and women who are out there on the streets every single day interacting with their communities. But does some of that, I know you don't want to get into politics, but does some of that political rhetoric contribute to actions such as we've seen last weekend? No, I, I don't believe so. I think these are just bad actors that are out on the street. Bad people who thought they could take advantage of our cops, and our cops will not take that. We will not, and we will arrest people for doing that. There have been bad actors on our streets for years. Matter of fact, there are a lot more bad actors back in the 80s and 90s than there are right now. But there are still bad people. In a city of 8.6 million, there are going to be some bad people out there, and that's why we have a police, and that's why we have our men and women out there every single day. Okay. I want to take a break. When we come back, I want to talk about the mayor's new initiative, um, a green wave to after 17 bicyclist deaths in the city this year, and also about the, the spike in, in gun violence. We'll be right back with uh, Chief Monahan. Stay with us as Pix 11 News Plus continues. In the aftermath of a dangerous surge in fatal bicycle accidents, 17 so far this year compared to only 10 this time a year ago, Mayor de Blasio this week unveiled a new bike safety plan. Henry Rossoff fills in the details. These last weeks have been something that should never be repeated in this city. Mayor de Blasio says his plan aims to make the roughly 460,000 bike rides that happen each day in the city more safe. The announcement comes after three crashes in less than 24 hours, including the death of a 17-year-old who collided with a tow truck on Staten Island. And in Brooklyn, there was a 58-year-old man who was killed after colliding with a box truck. Here's a look at the new bicycle safety plan by the numbers. It'll cost about $58.4 million, mainly to hire 80 new bicycle safety transportation workers. They'll install an average of 30 miles of protected bike lanes per year and redesign 50 intersections. The efforts will focus mainly on 10 areas of Brooklyn and Queens, designated as bike priority districts. They include the neighborhoods of Corona, East Elmhurst, Jackson Heights, Bay Ridge, Midwood, Sheepshead Bay, and Brownsville. NYPD traffic cops have already been doing more enforcement on cars and those parking in bike lanes, but the efforts will be redoubled, targeting 100 specific intersections with a focus on trucks. Well, thanks to Henry Rossa for that report. Let me clarify, we have 17 bicycle deaths this year compared to 10 for the entire last year. Back with uh, Chief Monahan. Now, it sounds like an ambitious plan, but how realistic is it? Well, uh, Polly Trottenberg has come up with a... Uh, Nice plan to try and do the redesign of all the streets, adding in the bicycle lanes. For us as a police department, uh, doing the enforcement, it's necessary. If we're going to have bike lanes, we have to make sure people aren't parked in the bike lanes. We've really picked up the enforcement of bike lanes, and also that includes us, to make sure that our police officers aren't pulling into that bike lane, having uh, the bicyclists out into the streets. We want to try and keep them as safe as possible. This is a huge uptick. 17 at this point, that's, uh, that's problematic. We have to do something. Now, how many police officers are going to be assisted to speak for the traffic division? It's traffic and it's for the local precincts. Our cops drive on these streets every day. If there is a car parked in a bike lane, they should take enforcement. Give it a summons. It's what we do. It's part of uh, the responsibility. Every cop has a sector. This is their area. This is where they are every day. If there's a problem in that bike lane, they should be taking enforcement in it. But there are some of those bicyclists out there that they're 
flagrant violators. I, I saw one on 8th Avenue right in the middle of traffic made a U-turn going the wrong way. Uh, but I didn't see a, an officer in sight. So many of these people are violating traffic rules. Well, How are you going to clamp down on them? We also have been summoned in the bicycles. They have to have take safety in the morning. Obviously a car will kill a bicyclist. A bicyclist won't kill a car. But we have to make sure that bicyclists are, are riding safely. You know, not going through red lights at intersections because the majority of these uh, fatal accidents that we've had has been a bicyclist entering a, an intersection against the light. So again, they have to understand it. We want to do some education with bicyclists, but we're also going to be doing enforcement on bicyclists too. Enforcement is a key word. Yes. Let's shift gears. Let's talk about you mentioned a short time ago, and, and we recognize the fact that crime is the lowest has been in the city in decades. Yet there's been a spike in, in gun violence, particularly in Brooklyn. Just, I think, this uh, the 15 uh, stray or drive-by shootings just recently. Yeah. 14. Well, not so much uh, drive-by, but there have been shootings on the streets where innocent people have been been shot in two, uh, two real bad ones. One that happened in uh, Manhattan uh, around a week or so ago where an 11-year-old was going into a store and there was a man running down the street, fired a shot at another individual and struck that 11-year-old in the shoulder. He's luckily going to be fine. We have some video out and hopefully we can identify him quickly. And just recently, St. Andrews Park in Brooklyn in the 7-9 precinct, there was a 13-year-old sitting on the bench she got shot in the shoulder, but uh, we have some very good information. We've identified who the perpetrator is on that. We're currently looking for him. Hopefully, we're going to have an arrest soon. Listen, gun violence is still at levels that we haven't seen anywhere except for the last couple of years. We are up, I, I believe, 20 shootings as we do this year compared to last year, and last year was far and away the best we'd ever had. Ended the year, I think, 754 shootings when just two, three years ago we were averaging never below 1,100. So the numbers are much lower, but these are some bad incidences. And then again, I'm going to say it, uh, in a city of 8.6 million, there's going to be bad incidences that happen, and it's going to be our responsibility as a police department to investigate and make arrests. Now, the predominant uh, spike has been in, in, in Brooklyn, and some have suggested that the prosecutor there, uh, Gonzalez, has just been too soft on these guys. We've talked to... Uh, uh, Eric, uh, the commissioner and the mayor had a meeting with him about this. He's compromised somewhat with some of the things that we're looking to do when it comes to gun violence. Uh, there's been a good, for the most part in Brooklyn, it's actually the last couple of weeks has been uh, a lot better than it had. It's eased up a little bit. There is a lot of gang violence in Brooklyn. Uh, the shooting of the 13-year-old did involve gang members. So it's something that we're always on top of. You know, it's always been my position that when it comes to guns, that's where we need to have heavy prosecution. So we don't always agree, myself and Eric, but we do work together. Okay, before we leave, let's go back to the initial thing, talking about this taunting and the dousing of water on police officers. What do you leave with a look at that audience out there and just deliver the final message? What are the consequences of these people who are getting caught? Consequences, they're going to be arrested. They're going to go in jail. They're going to have to. The, the man in Brooklyn is facing a felony charge because he damaged the officer's body camera and his radio. So it's a felony charge that he's facing. This isn't fun. Your officers are out there to keep you safe, to keep this city safe. They need to be respected. We want our officers to respect the people that they deal with in the city on a regular basis. We need to get that respect back. It has to be a two-way street. I hold my officers responsible to work with the communities, but members of the community have to be able to work with our cops. And they do work with helping us identify the few people who feel like they can disrespect the law. Chief of the Department, uh, Terry Monahan, thank you so much. Thank you, message. Bobby. Hope I they heed the warnings. Thank Thanks you. for joining us. Thank you very We're much. We'll take a break. We'll come back and talk about the crisis in Puerto Rico. Stay with us. Calm is returning to Puerto Rico this weekend after a tumultuous week of mammoth demonstrations that forced the governor under intense pressure from inside and outside his government to finally say he'll resign. Crowds on the streets of old San Juan cheering as Puerto Rico's governor announces his resignation. Protesters had been eagerly awaiting the moment for days, erupting into celebration after Governor Ricardo Roseo's announcement came down shortly before midnight Wednesday. 
The governor made the announcement in a video message on Facebook. Hoy les anuncio. Today I announce that I will be resigning from the position of governor effective Friday, August 2nd, 2019 at 5 p.m. Roseo indicating that staying on as governor was not a viable option. Despite having the mandate of the people who elected me democratically, today I feel that remaining in this position represents a difficulty to continue the success that's been reached. The governor's resignation comes after more than a week of protests in Puerto Rico's capital. Those demonstrations erupting after the publication of hundreds of offensive group messages among Roseo and his inner circle. The messages were laced with profanity, as well as homophobic and misogynistic language, even jokes about victims of Hurricane Maria. For some, Roseo's resignation couldn't come soon enough, and lawmakers were poised to begin impeachment proceedings. Justice Secretary Wanda Vasquez is expected to take over as governor when Roseo's resignation takes effect next Friday. So what next for Puerto Rico now? With me is John Melendez Rivera, a member of the resistance movement to oust Governor Rosejo out of office. Carlos Cuevas, an attorney and research affiliate with the University of Houston School of Law. He's written extensively about the Puerto Rico debt. And uh, Councilman Fernando Carrera, who was in the thick of the demonstrations last week. Puerto Rico has never seen demonstrations quite like this. Why is there such relief that the governor is finally out? Well, the the it's it's been a buildup in terms of what the problems have been in in Puerto Rico. So this is just sort of like an escape valve at this point. But the problems are just much more prominent than than than, than what we're seeing here. He it's it's it, the governor represents corruption. The governor represents his statements that he made on the 889 pages, and, and the people just had enough. Carlos, he's out, but the problem is not gone. Well, you have three major problems. One, you have Hurricane Maria. Two, you have five bankruptcy cases pending regarding the Puerto Rico debt the largest of them being the, the debt of the central government, which is approximately $72 billion. And the last qu problem, and one of the central problems, is where do we go from here? How does Puerto Rico reform itself and have a functioning government? How does that... How does that come about? How do you do that, Councilman? Well, you were down really, there. You were in the thick of it. Yeah, I, you know, I was there and still in communication with the people in Puerto Rico. It's going to be rather uh, difficult. As a matter of fact, there's going to be a demonstration on Monday uh, where the people are going to come out and say, we don't want Wanda Vasquez to be our next governor because she was under a, an ethical uh, investigation. Uh, there's still two issues that she's still dealing with that we hear is going to come out and more chats related to her where she refused to uh, pursue prosecution of someone, at least an investigation of someone. So we, this is not over. Uh, there's, there's tension and the, the basic fundamental problem is credibility. The government had lost, uh, and the elected officials had lost credibility. So this is a crucial time uh, for credibility to be reestablished. Now, some people say Wanda Vasquez is she's been compromised because she was slow, slow to react to the whole scandal. Uh, to the scandals, uh, to an investigation, uh, to a reporting uh, where uh, during uh, after Maria, uh, one of the storage uh, from FEMA uh, was in one of the uh, lobbyists uh, related to the party. She refused to investigate it. Uh, she doesn't have the trust of the people, and this is why there's going to be more rallies. Because you know, in all fairness, the people. I uh, had gone through a, a tremendous trauma. I was there right after the uh, hurricane. I spent three weeks in Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria. And let me tell you, they had gone through a traumatic experience. Uh, and they deserve better. They need leadership, and they're right now in a leadership crisis. Well, the, the problem, go ahead, Carlos. Marvin, one of the major problems is that $42 billion has been allocated by the federal government to address the problems in Puerto Rico but only $12 billion has actually reached the island. And absent ma a, a massive infusion of federal funding, it is going to be very difficult for Puerto Rico 
to reemerge. And the lack, of in, the lack of stability in the Puerto Rico government is really hurting the citizens of Puerto Rico. And just one last point on this. Puerto Rico has a very high poverty rate of 42 percent of 42 percent. And so and the child poverty rate is even higher. So innocent children are being harmed by this government. But also the workers have been uh, impacted by this. There's 72 billion dollars, if I'm correct. Uh, the pension fund in uh, 40, about 42 billion. So in, they're in not un getting their unfunded. pensions an unfunded pension, mm -hmm. and that's part of the bankruptcy. Yeah. What, 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 we, what we believe is that the, the, the problem, the main problem here is the colonial relationship that's gone on for these 121 years. And from a grassroots standpoint, what we are calling for is decolonization as required by UN Resolution 1514, which leads to independence for Puerto Rico. We believe on the, on, 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 at the grassroots level that that is really the way forward. It's a matter of, of, of decolonization as required by international law, which leads to independence because it is an inalienable right for us to have independence in Puerto Rico. The colonization is what manifests all of the problems that we were experiencing in the island. See? Now, his resignation, it seems to have united what we saw, a million people blocking the main highway in, in San Juan. Yes, but... Again, my colleague has touched on an important point. The Commonwealth status has not worked. My colleague, Councilman, who's been very involved in this, is in favor of statehood, and my colleague is in favor of independence. After Puerto Rico is stabilized, there should be a public site for the Puerto Rican people to decide their own destiny, whether they want statehood or whether they want independence. But it's something that they should have in terms of self-determination. My only problem with that, and I don't, you know, I, is that in our position, it's not a matter of a plebiscite. It's a matter of, it's a human right. It's it, it, a human right, meaning that it's an inalienable right, as, it's under, as it is in this country regarding liberty. That same premise is the premise that ought to be applied to Puerto Rico, because that's the same premise that's applied to the rest of the world. No. It's an inalienable right in terms of decolonization and independence. It's not a matter of choice, because what that means is that you cannot, an inalienable right is, is, is a right that you can, that cannot be taken away or given away. No, my point as is As defined simply, by, international, by the international my community. My point is simply this, is that the Puerto Rican people should vote on that issue. It's not a voting premise, that's my point. That, that's been the false narrative that's created the confusion and has led to this colonial disaster over these 121 years. That's the reason why we have not had consensus. The fact is that, that decolonization and independence, it's an inalienable right. It's not a matter of a plebiscite, it's not a matter of, of, of choice. And, and so uh, what we, are, we do have in agreement is the fact that the present status does not work. Commonwealth does not work. The path, I mean, we have two paths that, that Puerto Rico can take, but there's no way that the island of Puerto Rico, the people of Puerto Rico are going to be able to continue to function. And this is what I don't want. I don't want Puerto Ricans to be blamed. I don't want people to say, oh, it's because they don't know how to manage uh, their, uh, you know, their, their, their country, uh, so their island. So uh, I think it's, uh, it's critical that something happens that we cannot stay in, in, in the country. Carlos, we just have a couple of seconds left. Where does, how does Puerto Rico go forward now once he steps down next Friday? Puerto Rico needs to stabilize its government immediately and get federal funding in. That way it can rebuild after Maria. All right, Carlos Cuervas. John Melendez Barrera and Councilman Fernando Carrera, thank you so much for joining us. And that'll do it for our program for this week. If you have any comments or wish to see this broadcast again, log on to our website, pix11.com slash newscloseup. I'm Marvin Scott. Thanks so much for joining us. Enjoy the rest of your Sunday, everyone.